I'll just jump straight in. Um, it's great to be able to join you all. I think um, uh, one of the things that uh, has uh, become a common feature of uh, living now here in New Zealand for the last couple of years is that always our time zone is quite ridiculous for uh, international meetings. Not too bad uh, for meetings in the US, but certainly uh, with Europe there it uh, becomes a, a midnight affair. So uh, uh, hopefully uh, uh, don't ask me too many complicated questions. My brain is not up to its uh, usual standards. So uh, let's see how we go. Um, so what I wanted to um, share with you is uh, really some thoughts uh, in and around um, uh, how we understand uh, fractionation processes in clouds and really um, going back now and starting to revisit uh, some of the early work that was done um, all the way back in, well, maybe the 50s, but certainly the 60s and early 70s, perhaps, uh, about thinking about the microphysics of clouds. And, and now if we re, um, re uh, uh, consider some of those uh, fractionation processes, do we actually come up with some slightly different uh, conclusions and actually you know, we've already just seen um, some of the assumptions that go into thinking about uh, uh, ice clouds and um, if we can put some constraints on our understanding of the fractionation we may be able to understand the ice cloud and other sort of cloud uh, processes themselves a little bit better so in some ways this work is motivated by um, some observations we've been doing and I'll introduce some of those um, but also uh, thinking about how we might improve um, the way we depict uh, fractionation processes uh, to understand clouds a little bit better. So I was, I was really inspired by, for this talk, by um, uh, one of the classic papers, one of my favorite papers actually from all the way back in 1968 there, uh, by uh, Miyaki, who's uh, uh, a, uh, a Japanese scientist, and hello there to the folks uh, in, at the hub in Tokyo. Um, yeah, he did a, a study uh, at this island site uh, off, um, off Japan there, and he'd made measurements of rainfall at the top and the bottom um, of uh, a mountain. So this particular mountain is about, it's actually quite tall, it's 848 metres according to uh, Wikipedia, uh, and it's surrounded by ocean, so it's a nice uh, relatively idealised uh, system there. And what he found is sort of things that we, we kind of take for granted now in some ways, that is that the isotope ratio, uh, the, the diagram here is uh, um, the delta value of 018 on the left uh, versus time over a couple of hours of rainfall. And he was looking at the contrast between the top of the mountain versus the bottom of the mountain. Um, and he also had observations sort of not quite, but around about halfway up. And what he discovered is the isotope ratios of rainfall were quite different at the bottom versus the top. And the difference there between the top and the bottom, it's you know, maybe about five per mil, per mil uh, three or four per mil, certainly, which is quite a large signal that it's, it's really quite dramatic. Um, so this work and some other work uh, really inspired thinking about um, the influence of uh, post-condensational exchange. So evaporation of rainfall and the degree of fractionation that's associated with that uh, evaporation process or the isotopic exchange process which is fundamentally an out of equilibrium process. So that's really the theme here that when we think about uh, clouds and microphysics, um, often it's very convenient to think about the degree to which the condensate is in equilibrium uh, with vapor. However, when things are happening like condensation or evaporation, it's fundamentally out of equilibrium. So what degree do these fractionation processes out of equilibrium really influence the overall result? Uh, so it's really exploring that um, uh, in, in um, a more, more uh, uh, advanced approach is, is what we're thinking about here. So there's a couple of key elements here that uh, we, we might think of, and that is how do we model the uh, kinetic isotope effect for rain evaporation? And you know, this is sort of a theme, it's certainly in global model, regional scale models, um, there, there's treatment of this, uh, but it's not really clear that these treatments are right, that they're not often it's not often possible to do direct validation against observations. Um, and so that's part of uh, where we need to think there. And really the key is that if we think at the very detailed level, we can appreciate that some of the basic laws like diffusion probably works, uh, but how does it upscale to even a bulk microphysical sense? And I'm thinking bulk there being um, sort of orders of tens of meters. As soon as you get away from that molecular scale, the droplet scale, um, do the fractionation rules that we believe work at that small scale, do they scale up um, to the cloud scale? So uh, just to provide some motivation here, one of the things we've been doing for the last uh, several years is thinking about how we measure uh, really cloud water separately from water vapor from aircraft. And uh, here's an example of some of the work that we've been doing. And I give a note there to Dean Henzie's paper 
that's now in EESSD uh, that describes some of this data in association with the NASA Oracles mission, which is off the uh, coast of Africa in the Southeast Atlantic um, from a few years ago now. Um, what we're showing here in the diagram is uh, three plots uh, in the vertical on the vertical axis. Uh, the liquid water content and water content shown here. So the water vapor is in blue, the cloud water is indicated in black. And these measurements are from a series of up and down maneuvers through a relatively shallow stratocumulus uh, uh, deck. And so you can see there's multiple cloud passes here. This is of course what we can get from all sorts of different measurement approaches. Um, the middle diagram here is the delta D. And um, again, what, what's really novel here is not that you can measure the isotope ratios, is that we've separated the isotope ratios of the vapor in the cloud. So we have an independent measurement of the cloud. And um, uh, th this nice notion of, uh, I th I th in the case of ice, I guess we've just seen this notion of the, uh, the difference in the equilibrium value versus the actual value. That's a, exactly what we're thinking about here as well. The degree to which the cloud water, oops, where's my pointer? There it is. The cloud water is in equilibrium with the vapor. Uh, if the answer is yes, it is in equilibrium, then actually we really don't have too much to do here, that if it's in equilibrium, we could measure one and we could know immediately what the other one is. However, um, if they're not in equilibrium, it tells us something else. It tells us about the fact that the cloud, the dynamics of the cloud is pushing it out of equilibrium. For this experiment, we're particularly interested in the degree to which um, cloud water at the top of the cloud was evaporating. If it was evaporating, it's fundamentally out of equilibrium. So the, the question here is, can we detect that out of equilibrium uh, evaporation signal at the top of cloud. Um, the little technical detail, which I'm happy to share, is associated with the, the way we set up the inlet. We have two inlets in this approach, one that gets total water, so the sum of water vapor plus the condensate, uh, and the other one which separates out the condensate from the vapor, and we measure the condensate. Um, so the total water measurement is relatively straightforward. We have a single inlet that faces forwards and it's run in an isokinetic way. So everything coming into the, uh, the front of the inlet uh, is coming in at the uh, air speed of the aircraft or the speed of the aircraft. Uh, and that captures all of the material. Let me just measure it on a Picaro uh, uh, spectroscopic water vapor instrument. Uh, the other instrument's called a counterflow or the other inlet is a counterflow virtual impactor where the idea here is the uh, inlet design which is indicated here at the bottom left has air that is pumped outwards, forwards, out the tip of the inlet. And so only particles that have momentum, which means condensate, not vapor, can make it into the inlet. Uh, those particles are then vaporized. And again, they're measured on a uh, gas phase uh, spectroscopic instrument there. So with this dual setup, it allows us to get measurements of the isotopic composition of uh, cloud water independently from the measurement of the water vapor. So we can start to look at the microphysical exchange and this, this out of equilibrium component of the, of the, uh, uh, of the cloud system. Uh, here's an example of a measurement just to give you some context for what, what we're doing here. Uh, what we're looking at is uh, radar reflectivity over a stratocumulus deck. And again, this is off the coast of, um, of, of Africa over the Southeast Atlantic. Uh, and you can see here that there's uh, a, 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 a drizzling cloud deck where there's quite strong radar reflectivity and the Doppler velocity is shown here with um, the red values being rain that's falling. And so over this section here, we see a couple of big cloud clusters. This particular measurement is an interesting one um, because we had the opportunity to fly back and we flew back through this cloud uh, on a return pass. And so here's the zoom in. You can see as we flew back, we only measured the bottom half of it. And again, what we're able to measure there is the water vapor composition, great the cloud water amount. And as a little detail there that uh, traditional optical measurements for measuring cloud amount um, is uh, in the green, whereas our measurements are in the red. And we're actually able to pick up about one hertz fluctuations in the amount of cloud uh, with our, our measurement approach, which is telling us also that our isotope measurements are capturing that about one hertz fluctuation in the isotope ratios within the clouds. The isotope ratios themselves are indicated in the bottom where blue, uh, is the, um, uh, the water vapor content and then the red in, and green, I should say. Um, the red is the measurement of the water vapor content and the green is what we would expect from an equilibrium assumption. So if the cloud droplets were in equilibrium, we'd get the green. So they are similar, but they're not identical. And um, that's, that's the essential signature which we're uh, exploring there. 
Um, I wanted to provide another example here. And it, actually, I, I have to admit, I didn't anticipate the uh, previous talk very well. Uh, there's a nice overlap here uh, with some of that modeling work. And in particular, this measurement here uh, that we're looking at uh, comes from the same device where we're looking at the isotopic composition of cloud water. And in particular, this experiment is looking at uh, uh, cumulus clouds in the Caribbean and particularly in and around the freezing region. So on this diagram, the vertical axis, which one can think about as altitude, is actually in temperature. So it's a temperature scale with the freezing uh, isotherm uh, indicated in the middle there. And what we're looking at is the difference in the deuterium excess of the uh, condensate, although above the freezing level, it's mostly ice, uh, the deuterium excess in the interior of the cloud versus the deuterium excess towards the exterior. Uh, and the data has been partitioned between those data where there's updraft regions within the cloud versus down, right? That's uh, upward vertical velocity. It's updraft and downdraft may be um, too specific for the level of uh, detail here. It's when the vertical velocity is up versus the vertical velocity is going down. So what we see is the data clusters uh, quite distinctly and indicated by the cartoon here, um, where the vertical velocity is upwards, the data tends to the right where the vertical velocity is, it's actually weak or downwards, uh, the data clusters uh, to the left. So the deuterium excess is lower towards the edge versus the blue where the deuterium excess is higher towards the edge. So this is consistent with a very different microphysical pathway for these two approaches, that if the deuterium excess is higher, uh, it's indicating that uh, we would expect higher deuterium excess uh, under new ice formation, so deposition of ice with diffusive growth of ice crystals, versus we'd expect a negative value if we had uh, one explanation as being a liquid drop that's undergoing evaporation, as in the Bergeron process, as we have the transition from uh, liquid cloud uh, into ice cloud through that uh, mixed phase um, uh, relationship with different vapor pressures for um, uh, ice versus liquid. So um, there's, there's a way here to distinguish what sorts of uh, microphysical pathways are being taken by looking at the isotopic composition of the droplets themselves, in this case, of the ice crystals themselves. And again, the key here being uh, a measurement approach that really targets the microphysical component of the system, so the droplets. Um, so um, to put this in a context, I want to wrap this back into thinking about uh, how we might understand the uh, fractionation process going on here. And um, th there's really two mechanisms that we, we, we might think of in clouds. First of all, the, the, the growth or um, evaporation as well of droplets is, is by diffusion. And as soon as we say diffusion, we can al already imagine this kinetic isotope effects coming here with different diffusivity for different isotope logs. Um, if we imagine a, a cloud droplet undergoing growth, it is activated at some point, has some condensation nuclei, and it begins to grow uh, if the humidity is greater than 100%. So we might imagine diffusion of uh, molecules toward the droplet interior, the droplet surface, uh, it begins to grow and it would uh, increase its radius and uh, mass and it would grow. Um, because there's both saturation vapor pressure involved and uh, diffusion, but particularly the saturation vapor pressure, this process itself uh, is subject to a fractionation. So fundamentally the equilibrium fractionation, but because this is not an equilibrium process, it's undergoing condensation, this is not an equilibrium process. Uh, it, it, if this was allowed to continue to some equilibrium point to some um, steady state, Actually, it's to an equilibrium point, not a steady state. Um, it, it, we could think about isotopic equilibrium uh, and that how quickly that occurs is driven by the, the, the speed of the diffusion there. So it's fundamentally a, a fractionating process. However, this is not really the dominant process for the formation of rainfall. Uh, form growth of droplets, yes, but for the formation of rainfall, uh, droplets uh, are, are grown through collision and coalescence where uh, it drops when they get to a certain size there's a much higher probability that they bump into another drop and they would consequently grow. And um, I've indicated sort of a little mathematical depiction here that it ends up being an exponential growth that you get to a point where it undergoes an exponential uh, rate of growth. This is not a fractionating process here. There's, it's just capturing of droplets. And so fundamentally, this is just capturing whatever the isotopic ratio of the droplets is um, that gets collected and that gets compounded into um, the... Uh, um, 
uh, to isotopic composition of rainfall. I would say these, these mechanisms are sort of at the core of what's in uh, the, the models that we work with, the, the NCAR isotopic model. Um, I'm sure most isotopic models have this, these same basic uh, processes captured. Um, so this is already depicted in, in the models, nothing new here. Uh, what we can do though, is think about what this means in terms of uh, droplet size. So here we have a, a, a schematic of the number of drops, the number density of droplets, number per cc is a function of drop size. And if we imagine we have some activated droplets um, and um, they uh, begin to grow, uh, they'd grow by condensation, their radius would increase, but they get to a certain point where they undergo collision coalescence and they grow much more rapidly. So this is the point at which clouds undergo production of rain. Um, if that rain then evaporates a little bit, well, it all, all sort of goes backwards a little bit and the, 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 the radius of the droplets would uh, decrease. Um, uh, for those who are, are starting to fall asleep, and perhaps me is one of those people, this is a perfect time to see a giant equation. So luckily I have a giant equation. Um, this basic uh, can, um, process, set of processes can be captured in a, a bin microphysical model. Um, the, the way this is formulated is relatively standard. The only real difference here is the inclusion of the isotopic effects, um, which I've already described. Effectively, uh, we're thinking about uh, this distribution and modeling this distribution uh, under um, uh, with these various processes being active. So what do we get from this? Well, this gets back to this idea of are clouds actually close to equilibrium? What this diagram is showing is a, a, um, an idealized calculation of a raindrop that's undergoing growth. So the radius on the left versus time on the right, the drop undergoes or the drop population, I should say, undergoes uh, growth by diffusion and it grows from something very small up to about 20 